Good morning and welcome to St. Alphonsus Parish in Grand Rapids, Michigan. And welcome to our conversations about uh, spirituality, uh, integrating spirituality. And uh, I am one of the people who are sharing in this conversation with you, Father Tom Santa. And I'm happy to do so and happy uh, to be with you. Uh, I looked over what we shared together yesterday, and uh, I was, of course, quite critical of it, uh, critical of um, the way I looked, the mannerisms that I had, uh, the material that I shared. But I think that's quite normal as we're trying to find a way to uh, communicate in a way that's inviting and a way that's helpful. I know for myself, the reason I want to be with you and engage in this conversation is because I consider it to be a, a pastoral moment, a moment um, that we can use to our advantage during this time when everyone is uh, paused, when their normal routines are disrupted. Um, frankly, when you have time on your hands that you probably uh, haven't had on your hands in a long time. Uh, so this is an opportunity to use uh, some of that time in a uh, productive way. It's also because I truly, truly enjoy uh, being in a conversation with people about spirituality. Um, because spirituality, as I said yesterday, is integral. And that's why we use the word in integrative. It's integral to who we are as human beings. We are, as Teilhard de Chardin reminded us, spiritual beings who have human experiences. So that's a powerful statement to be able to say that within our human experience, within who we are, that we can discover something that is holy, uh, holy with an H, and holy with a WH uh, that's integrative, that's healthy, that heals, that gives life. Um, it's a powerful statement to, to make that within the expression of humanity and the things that we do, the ordinary things that we do and the extraordinary things that we do, that there's something about each of those experiences, people, events, um, that can lead us into a deeper sense of something bigger than ourselves, something more. Um, if you want to use words that are more traditional within a religious context, you would say uh, more blessed, more graced um, would be an example of what an integrative spirituality hopes to accomplish. I'd also like to say and I think it's always good when we enter into this type of relationship and we enter into this type of conversation to remind ourselves that we are limited by our ability to communicate. Uh, not only the social media platform that we're using, which is the best that we have available to us, um, but we're also limited in so far the fact that as human beings, our communication is limited. Um, we sometimes forget that the ability to communicate is only one part of our experience, and it's an incomplete part of our experience. None of us can adequately and completely, for instance, describe exactly what we feel or describe exactly what we see. Um, we can come close a lot of times, uh, but it is all based on the words that we choose, the expression that we have on our face, the inflection that we have on our voice, um, the way that the person who is listening to us, what they're thinking about at the time, all those are variables in how we communicate. And what we need to remind ourselves is, is that all communication is interpretive. It is by its very nature interpretive. When I speak to you, I am choosing to say certain things to you 
and in the process of choosing to say certain things to you, I am trying to interpret my understanding of the experience that I'm trying to share with you. But in the process of saying certain things to you, I am consciously and subconsciously also choosing not to say certain things to you. So that choice is interpretive. Um, interpretation by its very nature is limiting. So for instance, I might use an example and I might say the sky is blue. I have a very clear idea in my mind what blue means when I say that the sky is blue. But what happens if your experience of blue is not my experience of blue? What happens if I'm thinking, for instance, of a, a robin's egg blue, and you're thinking of the turquoise blue of the Caribbean Sea? They're both blue. They're both accurately reflected as blue, but there's a difference. And sometimes it's a distinct difference, sometimes it's a subtle difference. Um, the reason I, I like to bring this up is it reminds us of the fact that when we're entering into a discussion and sharing and conversing and talking as honestly as we possibly can, uh, Nonetheless, there will be something that's missing. We're never going to get quite to the point where we'd like to be. There's always going to be a level of frustration uh, because it's never quite enough. It's always incomplete. That, in fact, is a lesson that comes not only from human experience. It's an important lesson that teaches us something about spirituality. You can never talk about the spiritual, the experience of the spiritual, in terms that are totally and completely concrete and not open to interpretation. You cannot talk about the spiritual in the sense that of certitude, that this is it and that's all that it is. Um, and when you're talking about spirituality, it's best to understand that and to accept that. And not to see it as an obstacle, but to see it as part of who we are. That's why in spirituality we use tools that are more helpful for us, because they provide a more accurate interpretation, if you will. And those tools are things like um, stories or metaphors alliterations, examples, things like that that we use to try to evoke, if you will, from the person with whom we're sharing a certain response. But it's going to be different for each and every person. It's also going to be different based on the context of our own experience as a human being in time. Spirituality makes us very, very aware of time, or at least it should. As human beings, we know that we have an experience of time, at least we think we do, that's different from all of the creatures that exist in the universe, or at least in our universe, our solar system. We understand as human beings that we are aware of the present, that we're also aware of the past, and we're also aware of a future. And we effortlessly navigate, in a lot of ways, between present, past, and future. That's healthy. It's how we live as human beings. It's how we get our energy. It's how we get our life. It's how we get our imagination. It's how we experience our creativity. So the ability to move present, past, and future. In fact, the ability to navigate all three of those experiences of time are essential to who we are as human beings. If we didn't have them, if for instance, we only lived in the past, most people would say there is something fundamentally missing in that person's experience. Uh, and so 
The same goes true for the present or the future. There has to be an integration of the three components of time. This is important because it suggests, again, when one is talking about spiritual truths, that it suggests that it is impossible to accurately duplicate completely something that occurred one year ago, five years ago, a hundred years ago, two thousand years ago. Even when we use the same words, even when we use the same examples, they're different. They're different because of the passage of time, because of the passage of experience and events and the way that we understand something. You might notice every once in a while on YouTube or even on Facebook, somebody will put something there, a picture of something that was very useful to everybody, for instance, in the 1950s. And they'll say, if you know what this is, this is a pure example of the fact that you lived uh, sometime in the 50s because you understand what it is. And someone who is in the year 2000 and the year 2020 might stare at that particular example all day long and not know what it is because they have no experience of it. They have no understanding of what it is. They don't even have the ability to conceptualize what it is. But what you're staring at many times, the word that you use to describe it is exactly the same word that was described 50 years ago, or the word that is used today. The same word, completely different thing. For example, think of the ice trays that were part of the refrigeration system in the 1950s. Those nice aluminum or steel ice trays with the steel in the middle, and you had to pour the water in, and you put it in the refrigerator, and it got ice, and then you came out, and you pulled it, and you pulled it open, and the ice cubes came out. If someone puts that on the internet and says, what is this? People of a certain age know exactly what it is. People of another age look at it and couldn't tell you. Because when they hear the word an ice tray, they understand an ice and they understand tray, but it's generated completely different in a completely different system of refrigeration. And it comes out in a completely different way. They're both ice trays. They both have ice, but they're completely different. So that's just part of the experience, um, the challenge, if you will, and uh, the fullness of what it is when we enter into a conversation. I'd like to talk about that simply because it helps everybody in the conversation understand why certain things perhaps are emphasized at this moment and uh, certain things are not. Why I choose to talk about this, uh, perhaps why I choose not to talk about something else. And it also provides me and you with an opportunity to enrich our conversation by providing questions or comments or experiences as you listen to this conversation and as you engage with me in this conversation to enrich the conversations that follow. Of all the people that watched the first broadcast uh, between last night and tonight, or this afternoon or this morning, whatever time we're in, depending on when you're watching it is the time that you're in, uh, there's all sorts of people that responded and had different uh, ways of saying what they wanted to say or uh, the feedback that they wanted to share. Uh, there weren't too many questions yet, but that's to be expected. There'll be questions as uh, we continue on. But there was nevertheless a sense of community, a sense of conversation, a sense of we're all on this together, uh, which was very, very grateful. So at any rate, uh, let's keep all that in mind as we continue to talk about spirituality, as we begin to talk about our human experience, and we begin to talk about that which um, integrates us makes us whole, uh, makes us holy. I want to use a story that is, again, from another Jesuit. Here I am in the second day of talking, and I've used stories from two Jesuits. Uh, don't worry, I'll get to um, redemptive stories eventually. But this is another Jesuit, another spiritual teacher, 
uh, who is also deceased, and his name is uh, Anthony DeMello, Father Anthony DeMello. And Father Anthony DeMello was well known uh, as a teacher of spirituality. And one of the stories that he told very often is this story. And I think it uh, puts things into a uh, helpful context. This is the story. A man found an eagle's egg and put it in a nest of a barnyard hen. The eaglet hatched with the brood of chicks and grew up with them. All his life, the eagle did what barnyard chickens do, thinking he was a barnyard chicken. He scratched the earth for worms and insects. He clucked and cackled, and he would thrash his wings and fly a few feet into the air. Years passed and the eagle grew very old. One day, he saw a magnificent bird above him in the cloudless sky. It glided in graceful majesty among the powerful wind currents with scarcely a beat of its strong golden wings. The old eagle looked up in awe and asked, Who's that? That's the eagle, the king of birds, said his neighbor. He belongs to the sky. We belong to the earth. We're chickens. So the eagle lived and died a chicken, for that's what he thought he was. Anthony DeMello told that story almost every time he gathered with people because he was trying to help them understand and to see in a different way, to perceive what was true about their life and their experience, to dream, uh, to imagine. And they weren't possible able to do that unless they understood who they truly were, unless they were able to accept the fact that they were not using the story chickens, but rather eagles. And there's a whole different way of living. It's not to say the chickens are bad, or the eagles are superior. It's not to say that at all, or even to suggest that. What the story suggests is that you are best when you are who you are, not when you're something that you're not. If we go back to what Anthony DeMello says about who we are as human beings, he says that we're spiritual beings, not just people that are humans having spiritual experiences, that at the core of who we are, we're spiritual beings. So there's an, something within us that needs to be fed, that needs to be nourished, that needs to uh, be taken care of, that needs to be tendered, uh, that needs to be healed, that needs to be invited, that needs to be challenged, that needs to grow. And as spiritual people, we have a wealth of tradition that will enable us to grow and develop. And it's a journey, a wonderful journey, to find out who you are, to embrace who you are, and in the process of discovery, to live who you are, filled with God's life and love. So that's what we're talking about uh, when we're talking about integrative spirituality. One of the things, one of the last components that I want to introduce before I begin moving our conversation towards the specifics of what are some of the characteristics of spirituality that are important is a attitude. Um, a way of perceiving, a way of understanding, um, a choice that you learn how to make that's deliberate. Uh, and the best way that I can perhaps illustrate that is to tell a story. And those who have heard me uh, talk before have heard the story numerous times. But nonetheless, it's a pivotal story in my own spiritual growth 
but I also think it's a good story uh, for those who are entering into a deeper awareness of their own spiritual journey. It's a story about when I was living in Wichita, Kansas, and at the Spiritual Life Center, and I wanted to go on retreat. And I wanted to get away from giving retreats and actually um, have a retreat myself, just to be quiet and uh, to try to learn something and try to reset my direction, if you will. And in those days, the Redemptorist also had a retreat house in Amarillo, Texas. And at the retreat house in Amarillo, Texas, was a place where Father Pat Hawk lived, uh, who, as I've referenced before, was one of my important teachers in my life. It was also a place where Father Greg Myers lived, who's also one of the important teachers in my life and who will um, be referenced much later in our conversation. But in this particular story, I called Father Hawk up and I asked him if I could come down and make retreat with him. The drive from Wichita to Amarillo um, is about six and a half hours. It's not the most beautiful drive in the world. It goes through the southern part of Kansas, hits Oklahoma. You get to Oklahoma City, turn west, and go about 200 miles through the panhandle of Texas, and then you hit Amarillo. Have you ever been in Amarillo? Amarillo is on Highway 44. It's just 15 miles of what looks like strip malls and um, shops and places to eat. Uh, but there's a city there, of a couple hundred thousand, 300,000 people, I believe. And that's where uh, Bishop DeFalco Retreat Center was, and that's where Father Pat Hawk was. So I went to make a retreat with Father Hawk. And once I got into my room and everything, I went down to see Pat. And I asked Pat uh, if he would give me some real direction, and he just kind of smiled at me and uh, indicated that he was willing to do that. Uh, but he said, before I give you a direction, Tom, I want to tell you a story. I said, okay. He said, uh, in only the way that Pat Hawk can say it. He said, when I went on retreat recently, he said, I went to Hawaii. You gained Amarillo. I went to Hawaii. But anyways, uh, I went to Hawaii, and the first morning of my retreat, I got up, and I left the room that they had assigned to me, and I went down to the kitchen, and it was very early in the morning. And I went down to the kitchen, and I turned on the light, and when I turned on the light, a big black spider jumped. And he said, and I jumped. And he said, and I looked at the spider, and the spider looked at me, and then I, I left. He said, the next morning I got up early in the morning, went down to the kitchen, a little bit wary of what I might discover. And I went down to the kitchen and I turned on the light and the spider was there. And the spider greeted me and I greeted the spider. And then the spider performed a miracle for me. It weaved a web. He said, the next morning I got up, went down the kitchen, turned on the light, said hello to the spider. The spider said hello to me. And I performed a miracle for the spider. I made coffee. He said, now go to your room and think about that. And I looked at him with the kind of face I have right now. I looked at him and I said, go to my room and think about what? Just what I told you. Go to your room and think about it. So I went to my room. I didn't think about it. What I thought about was, what a waste of time. I just drove over six hours to come down here. And this is what I get for a retreat. I haven't unpacked yet, haven't slept in the bed. If I just take my suitcase out, stick it in the car, turn around and go home, nobody will care. But for some reason I didn't do that and I just sat there in my room trying to figure out what am I supposed to be thinking about? 
And as I'm sitting in my room, the time is passing because we had agreed to meet within a few hours. And it was getting closer and closer to the time that we were supposed to meet. And I had nothing. There was nothing going on. So finally, I went down to Pat's office and Pat welcomed me and smiled as he would. And he says, well, I said, Pat, I just, I don't know. I just don't know what you're, you want or what am I supposed to say? He says, it's not what I want. It's not what I think you should say. What do you want to say? I said, well, this is, I said, this is the only thing I could think of. I said, if it was me, I would have killed the spider. <laughs> he looked at me and he said, and if you would have killed the spider, what would have happened? And I said, um, I would have missed the miracles. And he just looked at me and he said, now we can start our retreat. Um, you see, Pat could have told me that what was important in the spiritual journey was patience. He could have told me that I had to be uh, more focused, that I had to pay attention. He could have told me I needed to be gentle with myself. Could have told me a lot of things. And they would have rolled right off my head because when people use the word gentle, I understand what gentle means. When people use the word focus, I think I understand what focus means. When people use the word growing in awareness, I think I know what that means. But it wasn't until I actually had a shared experience with Pat and we both came to an understanding together about the mystery of what we were engaging in, was I truly prepared to start the journey? And Pat knew that. He was very, very wise. And he knew that you couldn't just tell someone what to do. They needed to experience it for themselves, no matter how stupid it might seem. And here we are, some 35 years after I was going to get in the car and drive back to Wichita from Amarillo after wasting my time, here we are talking about a spider in Hawaii and how pivotal it was for a spiritual journey. I hope in our conversations, as our conversation continues in the days that follow this day, that we have the courage to stand in the mystery that you have the courage to um, be patient with yourself, that you have the courage to be not looking for answers, that you just let it unfold, that it doesn't have to be the way that you want it to be. You don't have to understand every word. It's okay if your experience is different than someone else's experience but just to enter into it with a sense of anticipation, a sense of gratefulness. And in that anticipation and in that gratefulness, you will discover an integrative self, a whole self, a holy self. That's not my promise to you. That's the promise of the journey that we share together. Have a great day and I'll see you tomorrow.